welcome to Inside Edition to discuss national, regional and international issues in depth. The Manama Dialogue held by the International Institute for Strategic Studies is considered a central element in the region's security architecture. National leaders, ministers and senior officials from the Gulf, the wider Middle East, North America, Europe and Asia are offered a concentrated occasion to consult bilaterally and multilaterally on the most important security and foreign policy challenges as trans or as transnational security threats and geoeconomic factors dominate domestic and international policy making process. Coinciding with the 60th anniversary of the establishment of the IISS, the Middle East Premier Security Summit took place recently in Bahrain, in which some of the most powerful policymakers from the Middle East and beyond addressed the region's most pressing uh, governance challenges. We will discuss this matter with Bahrain Center for Strategic International and Energy Studies, Dirasa, Strategic Studies Programs Analyst, Mahmoud Abdel Ghaffar. But first, this for more. The region's premier security summit, the IISS Manama Dialogue, kicked off its sessions with a focus on the shifting challenges to peace and security in the Middle East. The Manama Dialogue has established itself as really the premier security dialogue in this region. And uh, as a diplomatic event, you know, we need uh, forums like this where the senior leaders from countries uh, from the region and from outside the region can come together in an atmosphere uh, that's well organized, well planned to really discuss the issues of the day. Global government leaders tackled the region's most pressing governance shortfalls and evolving policy approaches to security in the region. Several issues were tackled, including the increasing risk of interference in internal affairs of nations and the need for defense and economic partnerships in the form of a Middle East strategic alliance, dubbed MESA, to enable cooperation and security. The Manama Dialogue is one of the most important or the most important forum to discuss the pertinent questions to this region. And we are very happy to have uh, Federal Minister of Defense Ursula von der Leyen here with us. I think this is a very important moment for the region. Also on the agenda today were diplomatic challenges to conflicts in the Middle East and their shifting dynamics with a focus on a need to resolve the plight of the Palestinian people and securing results for the Middle East peace process. This is where people exchange views and actually get to think together how we are confronting our challenges. And it's very important because this is where the Arab world, Manama Dialogue managed in the past few years to develop itself into a brand. It is just crucial to, uh, to be able to gather uh, decision makers from uh, almost all over the world in order to formally or informally leave space oxygen to exchange on issues that are crucial for our world. Another successful start to the annual Manama Dialogue with a stated need and focus to employ diplomacy to achieving security in the region. Pressing political and defense issues being discussed here in Manama as another dialogue attracts high-level figures and regional and global participants. Hamid Shaban, Bahrain International News. Joining us in the studio is Mr. Mahmoud Abdel Ghaffar. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Mr. Mahmoud, you've been at the Manama Dialogue over the past few years, and, and there are always little differences. But um, specifically this year, we've seen a huge number of attendants. It was larger than before and even higher ranking when it comes to the actual officials that were there. So how do you value the attendance of these 50 government ministers and senior officials that represented 25 nations from across the Middle East, Africa, Europe and North America? Well, first, I'd like to say that it is a testament to the Bahraini leadership for continu continuing to host this very prestigious regional event mm -hmm. that has a uh, uh, international reputation of being a very high caliber, high level uh, forum for discussions. And it's a very useful avenue because it brings together decision makers, academics, researchers, and media personalities all together to discuss pressing issues and, uh, and uh, concerns of the region in a very friendly and conductive and effective manner that yeah. is not really seen in, in, other, in other types of events. So yes. this is why it makes the Manama Dialogue uh, a very special event. 
in, in addition as well, uh, it uh, fosters a very nice and uh, uh, a very hospitable uh, uh, environment for officials to, to discuss one another in a very relaxed way and uh, uh, conduces uh, effective manners to uh, come up with solutions to a lot of the problems both in the region and beyond as well. Yes, yes. We also see <coughs> that there are some uh, key players that have been coming over and over for a few years now. One of them is the German Defense Minister, Osla von der Leyen. Um, we also mentioned um, uh, some of the Egyptian um, and other MENA region uh, officials that come. They've been coming for three, four years. What made this edition of Manama Dialogue unique compared to the ones before? And why do people like these actually keep on coming and feel that the Manama Dialogue is that important? Well, that's a very good point, actually, because uh, I believe that the, uh, this year's rendition is very unique yeah. in the sense that there was a lot of, a lot of the discussions focused looking on uh, pursuing solutions for a lot of the issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why uh, the German defense minister continues to come and uh, people, officials like her, of her stature is because this is the main forum for the region. Yes. And they, uh, she can uh, uh, directly address the region as a whole in through, in through one event. Yeah. And uh, it's also some of the new uh, characteristics of this year's rendition is that there, uh, there were discussions uh, concerning the Horn in Africa, which yes. is actually Bahrain uh, pushed for this uh, topic to be discussed because it's a very important region, uh, a sub-region that is uh, interlinked with the, uh, the Arabian Gulf and yeah. the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of uh, global audiences are concerned with this region because it's a very critical region in terms of uh, uh, global trade and uh, also the international flow of energy. Yes. Uh, and uh, another also new aspect of this year's Manama Dialogue would have to be that there we see a lot more domestic capabilities from local Middle Eastern uh, countries in yes. very new fields such mm -hmm. as uh, nuclear energy for civilian purposes, uh, cyberspace, uh, defense manufacturing industry. These are all new topics that have uh, sort of uh, uh, reflect how the, the capabilities within this region is increasing in these new fields. Yes. And we also, um, uh, like one point that was also mentioned um, um, in, uh, intimately was, was the refugee uh, crisis from a few years ago and how it has progressed now to basically um, uh, people having more shelter, poverty being overcome and so on. What can you comment to us on, on what is being done for the refugees of the world? I think in terms of the, the refugee uh, uh, folder uh, or file in this region, uh, it comes down to uh, where we are now as a region. Now we are in the phase where we have to find solutions and these solutions are now being uh, uh, pursued f uh, through international organizations such as the United Nations. Uh, and uh, they identified uh, in both these organizations and in the Manama Dialogue that there is a uh, key phases in order for the refugees to return to their homelands and yes. one of them is being a restabilization yeah. both politically and at the level of uh, a c a cessation of hostilities. Yeah. Uh, once uh, you uh, address this concern then you go into the reconstruction phase yeah. and when you reconstruct you build the vital infrastructure needed to return uh, some of these refugees to uh, their homelands, schools, hospitals, schools, hospital everything. roads, uh, everything that is needed in terms of this yeah. and then finally you would actually have the, the logistical phase of uh, returning the refugees because as you know many of these uh, people who are suffering uh, conflict zones throughout yes. the region and uh, that it will require international effort for them to return back to their home countries. Reintegration into their own home exactly, countries. Exactly yes yeah. but uh, these phases are critical because uh, without them the, uh, the, the, it will not make it very attractive for the refugees to return to their countries. Right. right. Well, um, Bahrain's Foreign Minister, Sheikh Khalid bin Ahmed Al Khalifa, pointed out um, during the Manama Dialogue that a proposed security alliance grouping the United States, Gulf states, Jordan, and Egypt would be activated next year. How important um, is establishing such an alliance, although really in the background the alliance has been there for a long time? Well, uh, you know, this is a really interesting development because it's, uh, I believe that this is an evolution of the international relations and uh, international community where you want to see um, local ownership for uh, managing their uh, regional affairs. Yes. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, talks and uh, analysis concerning uh, mechanisms that best suits uh, for countries to actually engage in their regional affairs. And one of them is being uh, security alliances. 
Uh, and this also goes back to the, the, the theory of multipolar world, where geopolitical power is now distributed amongst many uh, states yes. and organizations. And so naturally, uh, alliances is a very uh, favorable uh, mechanism f in order to realize uh, or, or, or empower regional players to manage their affairs. And uh, MESA, or the Middle East Strategic Alliance, yes. is, uh, is an example of this multipolar world, where there is enough uh, international support to uh, for regional players to manage their affairs. And uh, wh what's great about the international community as well is that they can provide their experiences with their own uh, security alliances, such as uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and, and any other uh, alliance. So they can, uh, these regional actors can benefit from those experiences and implement it in a way that is best, best suited for this region. Yes. Uh, to, uh, for instance, uh, <coughs> making a, uh, custom tailoring uh, joint military exercises, creating forums to identify key threats within the regions. Yeah. This is all that's needed uh, for a successful alliance to occur in this region. Yes. Now, um, a lot of these uh, countries, specifically the um, the Gulf countries, um, uh, have uh, the challenges closer to home um, than the other parts of the alliance. I mean, um, Iran is a joint um, uh, uh, country where the challenges are we are facing, or these this alliance, all of the countries in the alliance are are facing problems with Iran specifically, um, with the leadership. What can you tell us about? this establishment is it going to be like a think tank on how to solve these problems or is it more going to be like an action taking alliance in terms of the uh, middle eastern security yeah. alliance uh, well it has to uh, en encompass many different factors we have the the military aspect mm -hmm. this is where uh, defense uh, officials will get together and discuss uh, specific technical issues like for instance for in terms of armament and uh, responses and drills, but yeah. you also have the uh, more theoretical and uh, ana analytical side of it where you have to sit down with different uh, experts in the fields and uh, high level officials to identify what are the most key issues in terms of facing uh, uh, Iranian destabilization in the role. Well, while well, Tehran attempts to destabilize the region, um, and, and it's abundantly clear that they've been doing this over and over for, the, for, for years. Saudi Arabia's Foreign Minister Adil Jaber said in his speech specifically, we are now dealing with two visions in the Middle East. One is a Saudi vision of light, and one is an Iranian vision of darkness, which seeks to spread sectarianism throughout the region. Having the sanctions against Tehran come into effect, what are the expected challenges and ways to counter any further Iranian ex uh, aggression, especially with the uh, latest uh, involvement of President Trump and what he has said on TV? Well, that's a very interesting point, actually, because uh, sanctions are a diplomatic tool to rein in malign activities of, uh, of states. And uh, Iran has faced many rounds of sanctions before, but this one is uh, unique in the sense that it will target uh, uh, specific uh, elements of the Iran Revolution Quds uh, Force, uh, of uh, also different uh, uh, elements of its proxies as well. But in order for the sanction regime that is targeting Iran to be successful, it requires commi commitment from all the players involved uh, that are enacting these sanctions against Iran. And uh, unfortunately, since the inception of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the theocratic regime in Iran has played a destabilizing role throughout the region, often meddling in the internal affairs of other, ca uh, other countries, uh, undermining national institutions. Yeah. And uh, this unfortunately has uh, created a response from the international community to engage them on sanctions. Yes. And uh, just to curb this, uh, this, uh, this behavior. Yeah. Um, and uh, unfortunately, even when Iran is faced with sanctions, we often see it, it increases its meddling, it increases its interference in other yes. countries. And, uh, and, and uh, usually it will uh, try to disrupt um, global uh, uh, trade routes or sea routes, if you will. Uh, m many of them being the Bab al Mandeb Strait, Strait yes. of Hormuz, it, th it constantly threatens these uh, these regions or these areas, and you would expect that uh, there will be an increase in the, in these threats, and uh, uh, possibly there will might be an activation of uh, certain uh, Iranian proxies to disrupt uh, neighboring countries as well, which is uh, why the, this region has to remain uh, steadfast and vigilant in terms of. Uh, of defending itself against such proxies, against such actions. And it's also imperative to uh, the region as well to support countries that are actively trying to reverse Iranian interference, yes. uh, such as Iraq. 
and to uh, communicate the importance of having uh, of national institutions uh, for the betterment of the country itself. Yes. Well, it's also um, uh, very uh, good at this point to also uh, emphasize on the point that even during the Manama dialogue and during other speeches of um, uh, the foreign ministers of Bahrain and Saudi, it was it kept mentioning that that the Iranian uh, problem at this point is a leadership problem. It has nothing to do with the actual country of Iran. It is a neighbor country. It is a country that is part of the Middle East area, and the people of Iran are people that are um, intelligent, very known all around the world for all of their achievements and. At the end of the of of the line, um, um, th once Iran stops the behavior, it will be welcomed back into the area um, where it belongs, where it's been there for years. So, what can you come with that? Oh, uh, I think that the distinction between the Iranian people and government is very important because the uh, the people they have a very proud history. They're yes. very proud of their identity, but they might not uh, support the government's policies, which is often. Uh, involves uh, meddling the affairs of other countries and uh, creating a destabilizing environment. Yes. And uh, of course, uh, they, uh, the Iranian people themselves, they're the ones who are suffering the decisions of yes. the government itself. And uh, that distinction is very important to make because uh, they're not in the same uh, boat in terms uh, of this uh, issue. Yes. And, uh, and, and uh, the regime itself, it's a theocratic regime, which yeah. uh, in all honesty, there aren't many in the world the only other one I can think of is maybe the Vatican, but you know it doesn't involve uh, engaging yes. this kind of level of politics. Yes. And uh, this this uh, theocratic regime, where clergymen are running the country uh, at the expense of the people, is it's it's very uh, concerning for the region and beyond. Yes, yes. Well. On behalf of His Majesty King Abdullah II, uh, Jordan's Foreign Minister Ayman Safadi delivered uh, the Manama Dialogue keynote address in which he advocated taking holistic approaches to long-term challenges, including the Palestinian peace process, the refugee crisis, and combating extremist ideologies. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, dear friends, uh, I'm honored uh, to be here with you today on behalf of His Majesty King Abdullah II bin Hussein, who uh, sends his greetings to all of you and as you all know, as Dr. Chipman has just mentioned, stayed at home uh, in light of the tragic accident resulting from the flash floods that we did see uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, I start uh, quoting His Majesty. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Your Royal Highness, Dr. Chipman, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends. It is a great pleasure to take part in the Manama Dialogue again. For the long support of these summits, let me express my appreciation to His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa and His Royal Highness Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa. Dr. Chapman, General Beckett, my thanks also to you and the entire WIWS team. As I prepared to be with all of you this evening, I thought about the vital role of the Manama Dialogue, which has given this region a unique summit-level setting to tackle important security issues, share ideas and expertise, and identify solutions. But even more important is your power to take this regional dialogue forward and outward to raise global understanding about our region and its central role. Today, there's a constant flow of news about regional issues. One moment, a crisis is at the top of our screens. The next minute, global headlines have turned to a different crisis. But as every expert in this room knows, events and their impact do not end because the news cycle has moved on. The refugee crisis continues. The rights of Palestinians continue. Their status as refugees continue. The challenges of unemployment and lack of opportunity continue. Environmental dangers continue to threaten health and development and terror and Islamophobia are still threats to our collective future. These serious challenges are long-term, complex, and interrelated. They are global in scope, and they have deep roots. It goes without saying that successful solutions must be just as holistic, just as global, and just as deep. To achieve security, the international community must also address justice and inclusion and opportunity. To create opportunity and economic growth, the world must also ensure stability and confidence. 
and to provide truly global justice and inclusion, we as a world must always stand up for the values on which human coexistence depends. Mutual respect, collective action, and long-term commitment are central to the security issues you are discussing here at this dialogue. In our region, we've seen significant military victories over the Khawarij, the outlaws of Islam, but there is still vital work to do to consolidate the gains and help crisis-torn communities rebuild. And let's not forget that as these challenges and threats are addressed, the operational threat remains global. If the international community ignores today's hotspots, they will only spread. As I've said before, this is a generational fight. The ideological aspect is key. The Khawarij rely on a pseudo-religious ideology to justify murderous acts and foment sectarianism. We need to do more than expose their lies and crimes. We need to counter their false narrative with a true one that offers human solidarity and hope. Jordan has led a global effort to articulate the real social values of Islam, tolerance, compassion, mercy, and respect for the dignity of all men and women. We seek an international interfaith dialogue against bigotry and against hate. From the local community to cyberspace, the voices of coexistence must be heard. And the principles of coexistence must also guide our collective action. The countries of the world have a security interest as well as a moral duty to ensure that all people, especially young people, share in the promise of this century. Global support is especially important for refugee host countries like mine that have borne the brunt of multiple regional refugee crises. Our international partnerships need to stay strong until this crisis is truly over. Only one part of the job is to help prepare refugees to return to their homes and rebuild peaceful, prosperous communities. The other equally important job is to help the host communities that have sacrificed so much to do the right thing and support the sustainable, inclusive development that is essential for regional, global stability and growth. My friends, another critical security concern for the region and the world is the long denial of the Palestinian statehood. This conflict has been a global disruptor of peace and stability. When occupation and violence continue for generations and the peace process hits a dead end again and again, this is not just the failure of the parties. It is a failure of global strategic relationships and credibility. Eight years ago, here at the Manama Dialogue, I argued that our region will not enjoy security and stability unless we solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This has sadly proved true. And we cannot expect better until our world does much, much more to guide the parties towards a just and durable two-state solution. One that meets the needs of both sides, is fully in accord with international law and resolutions, provides an end to the conflict, and creates, my friends, a viable, independent, sovereign Palestinian state on the 1967 lines with East Jerusalem as its capital. There have been many attempts to delay and subvert the hope of the two-state solution offers. Today, these negative efforts include the fallacy of a single binational state. Any such solution based on unilateral acts and unequal rights would be a moral disaster and a recipe for continued conflict. Lasting peace cannot be unilateral. It can only be built by respecting the rights, hopes, and needs of both sides. This is the real security of peace. And let's also remember this. In order for people to live in peace, they must be empowered to prepare for the day of peace. For that, Palestinian schools need to be open and families and communities need our protection. My friends, UNRWA must be fully funded. In the days ahead, global collective action will be more important than ever. Above all, we need to safeguard Jerusalem's holy sites and historic Arab, Muslim, and Christian identity. Anything that puts the holy city in jeopardy would be a deep religious offense to billions of people around the world. To me personally, and to all Jordanians, the Hashemite custodianship of Jerusalem's Islamic and Christian holy sites is a binding duty. Join us 
and protecting the holy city as a unifying city of peace. My friends, when the world's people, especially young people, can see a future of hope, the whole global community benefits. And when our central strategic region is strong and successful, the whole global community shares in the benefits of our stability, security, and growth. And the days ahead, I hope you will take that message to the world. We need all of you on the lead to help the international community work together, talk together, and keep to its principles. I wish you every success. Thank you. That speech um, addressed a lot of important uh, problems in the region, um, older problems like the Palestinian um, issue, but also um, uh, solutions for this, which was coexistence and tolerance. What can you comment on the speech of His Majesty King Abdullah II that was given by his foreign minister? Well, it was a very uh, holistic speech that uh, addressed many issues in the region. And uh, more specifically on the Palestinian uh, issue, uh, we actually saw something very unique in this year's Manama Dialogue, where we saw regional efforts to restart these, uh, uh, the peace uh, uh, talks. And uh, this is very important because for years, uh, many uh, observers have uh, said that uh, the Palestinian issue now has sort of been in the backdrop in light of all the different developments that have occurred since then. But it's, 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 very, um, it's very good to see that it's returning back to the forefront, that uh, the region itself is able to uh, c come up with a solution for this uh, long-standing issue that has caused uh, numerous amounts of sufferings for, uh, for decades now. Yeah. And uh, in the terms of some of the, uh, re uh, the real social Islamic values that uh, uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Jordan, uh, discussed, uh, uh, this is actually very reflective on Bahrain's own capabilities as well, because uh, as you know, Bahrain is a very multicultural society, and we're very proud of this uh, uh, fact. And uh, with, uh, there's actually been more recent uh, initiatives to support this, such as His Majesty King Hamid Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence, yes. is, a, is a very important institution that reflects Bahrain's willingness uh, to always support and, uh, and, and, his, uh, and his pride in uh, its diverse society. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really becoming more of a global model for other uh, regions as well. Uh, actually, in the Manama Dialogue itself, we actually saw U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis yes. uh, respond to a question where he was asked uh, about uh, tolerance, religious tolerance in the region. And he actually said that Bahrain was a model of to tolerance for this region and beyond. So it's, it's a very, it's, it's very uh, humbling to hear these uh, very nice statements from very high-level officials. Yeah. Uh, and, and as well, this also uh, ties into Riyadh's vision of light as well, because uh, the vision of light is one where it is against uh, 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 sectarianism, against violence. And how do you counter these uh, different aspects? With uh, Islamic principles of uh, coexistence, uh, of uh, tolerance and compassion, and these uh, elements uh, it's what drives this vision, the, the vision of light from uh, Saudi Arabia and its allies to create a, a prosperous region for uh, development can uh, occur and where people can coexist in a very uh, peaceful manner. Yes. Well, um, the, as you said, the King Hamad Global Center for Peaceful Coexistence is one of the initiatives Bahrain has done. Another one is um, uh, very, I mean, it's part of the, uh, of the initiative, which is the um, Sapienza University um, Chair for the Study of Peaceful Coexistence. And, and to actually take over um, a theoretical uh, educational program that teaches coexistence, that is the first in the whole world, isn't it? Exactly, and this goes back to the point where Bahrain is becoming an international model for uh, peaceful coexistence. And uh, many of the different countries now are beginning to appreciate this, uh, these, these initiatives. And it's, it's really uh, uh, making Bahrain a sort of a regional model for, uh, you know, for always striving for, to find solutions and for stability. And, uh, and it goes against to show that the, the leadership has really considered this a very important aspect of the country. And uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic that there's a lot of uh, positive reception to these initiatives as well. Yes. Well, during uh, the Jordanian Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, his speech, the, he said that uh, Jordan has uh, led a global effort to articulate the real social values of Islam 
tolerance, compassion, mer mercy, and respect. Bahrain has played a pivotal role, as we have said, in supporting these efforts and spreading the culture of coexistence. As India's prime minister stated recently, and you also mentioned James Maras, Bahrain is a model of religious moderation and peaceful coexistence. Tell us more about the principles that Bahrain bases coexistence on. Well, you know, as you know, you know Bahrain is a very uh, it's a small country, but uh, irrespective of its size, it's a very diverse country. So uh, it, the, that diversity is sort of what propels the country um, to always find uh, models or frameworks for peaceful coexistence. And uh, the fact that uh, India's prime minister recently said this about Bahrain, about its initiatives for. Uh, religious moderation and peaceful coexistence is again it's another testament that the country uh, really is uh, is curtailing its own experiences and yes. trying to uh, show the world and become a model for this so it's it's it's, it's just a positive attributes uh, for the for this country for its government that uh, other countries are beginning to appreciate uh, these uh, efforts uh, to uh, always lead a, a, a stability and peaceful coexistence within society yes well, British Minister of State for the Middle East and North Africa, Alistair Burt, said that the Manama Dialogue has become a fixed event for international policymakers to discuss security issues in a friendly environment. I think it's a very special uh, presentation that the King of Bahrain is able to demonstrate through the Manama Dialogue. Uh, over the past 14 years, uh, the dialogue has become very fixed in the minds of the international experts who look at foreign affairs, security affairs, defense matters, getting together in Manama matters. There's lots to talk about, there's always good papers to be presented, but actually it's the warmth of the relationships that matter. What Manama does is it brings people together. It's not just dry ideas, it's not abstract thoughts, it's the individuals who make decisions and the individuals who need to interact with each other. In a way, the tolerance of this building is shared by those with the Manama Dialogue. Terrorist Financing Targeting Center is a U.S. Gulf initiative to stem finance to militant groups established in May 2017 during U.S. President Donald Trump's trip to Saudi Arabia. What are the reasons behind establishing the center and do you value its contribution to the collective effort to identify, tackle, and share information related to terrorist financing networks? Well, the Terrorist Financing Targeting Center, which I will from now on refer to as TFTC, um, is a result of allies communicating, uh, sharing their experiences, and seeking new ways to combat terrorism. While the military aspect to counterterrorism is often uh, short term, uh, there's other ways to target terrorism in a more effective manner and one of them is being to targeting its financial yes. uh, links uh, and uh, the center is also like uh, it's an international deliberation uh, that aims to bring a collective effort of uh, the different members in order to combat um, destabilizing actors uh, throughout the world and one of the goals of the TFTC is actually to uh, disrupt uh, the Iranian uh, and Hezbollah destabilizing policies yes. in the region and beyond and uh, by targeting the Hezbollah Shura Council, which is uh, commonly known as the political wing, actually uh, it's always been an impediment to target uh, the, the financial activities of Hezbollah and uh, the Iranian Revolution Guard Corp, the Quds Force. So this center actually is uh, very well established in order to, to, to target these uh, different institutions and uh, financially to, so it makes it a lot more difficult to, for them to carry out destabilizing operations in the region and beyond. Right. Well, um, when it comes to the financing terrorism, I mean, uh, financing terrorism, we've seen a lot of changes, even like from um, uh, the central bank and, uh, the, and, and and many other organizations, where they monitor very closely where the finances go, even of labor workers, uh, fi normal transactions, and so on. Is does more have to be done, or or is that it? Well, this also complements the, uh, the recent uh, sanction regime that is targeting Iran. Uh, of course, uh, any sort of uh, technical details in terms of, uh, of money trails, of uh, targeting financial of a specific individuals, it goes a long way because it makes it difficult for uh, these uh, individuals to conduct very uh, uh, destabilizing uh, activities abroad. And uh, that's, th that's the purpose, that we have to find 
uh, financial ways and mechanisms in order to stop uh, these uh, individuals uh, from the Iranian Revolution Guard Corps and from uh, Hezbollah, uh, from stopping them to uh, finance a lot of these destabilizing policies that they're conducting. Yeah. One of the uh, ways they infiltrated or um, uh, war terrorism gets uh, some of the finances uh, through is um, uh, online cyber um, wars that are being financed by different companies. Um, is that another um, uh, tactic um, that, that should be looked into uh, cyber protection and cyber uh, wars that are being um, met now? Uh, I believe that's the world, how it's developing and it's becoming much more complicated and interlinked. You do need multilateral uh, efforts to combat uh, uh, specifically financing of terrorism because it's it's been it's very it's very complicated just as you uh, mentioned because it, it also involves a lot of uh, cyber elements you know targeting of different financial institutions yes. uh, uh, ransomware as they're calling it uh, and it's 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 generating revenues for these terrorist organizations so obviously uh, the more the uh, members and allies communicate and share the experiences the more they are able to effectively. Uh, combat the finance of terrorism. Well, uh, Manama Dialogue 2018 has ended and preparations have already started for the 2019 one. Um, do you have any um, thoughts on, on what will be the points of focus in next year's Manama Dialogue? Well, it's always going to reflect the, the conditions of the global, uh, global politics, obviously. And uh, I, ex uh, I believe that uh, the Manama Dialogue uh, uh, will always look be at the forefront of uh, of addressing uh, most the most pressing issues uh, and concerns. And I think Bahrain, as a host of the Manama Dialogue, puts in a very special position because uh, it, it means that Bahrain's, regardless of its small size, can have a huge global impact in the world. Thank you very much thank for you. being with us today and answering some of our questions. And I would also like to thank you for be watching us and see you next week in another episode of Inside Edition.